very much, Nathan, for that Bible reading, and thank you, Wing, for our song about surrender. Now, what we want to do this morning is to begin, and it is, we're starting this all now from the book of Titus, and it's a gospel-centered communities. So, I, uh, our title today will be this one, Gospel-Centered Order. So we just will see that, but this is just to, um, to remind us, um, it, mine is on, it is on, I know. Um, you can help us. Right, got him. Right, we began in the series here when uh, Winston, it's, it works. Oh, what? I think so. No, you worked it, okay. Okay, we began the series um, with Winston and he was reminding us that this was the beginning. Paul had left Titus in the island of Crete, and it's just south of Greece. And in that island, he didn't have time to remain, so he left Titus there to establish uh, the churches, to bring the churches into a network and showing them how they could be formative together. Right, thank you very much. And now, if you remember, he spoke of the common faith. And remember, Winston showed us this picture. What is common about your faith? If you saw the picture, what is common about your faith? It is that Jesus Christ who is God, was crucified in my place and he rose again from the dead and is alive forevermore. So that's the common. That's what binds us, brings us together and makes us a unified union and community to even reach our world around us. Here is the map, as you can see, that's what we call the Mediterranean. Medi means middle, so it's an ocean that's in the middle of our globe, and there it is. It's called Mediterranean. It's a large sea, and in those seas, a little few more seas, a Aegean Sea, is uh, between those uh, Greece and Italy, and uh, then the other one is a Aegean Sea, and Adriatic Sea. Sorry. Adriatic Sea between Greece and Italy, and so it goes on. But there is Crete, as you can see just below. Now the reason Paul was very concerned about this island, because what it, Crete had become, it is in, right in the middle of all the shipping lanes that were going back and forth through the Mediterranean. And in that sh all those shipping lanes, that means Many, many foreigners, sailors, and different people were going to come to the island. And of course, many on the island were seafarers themselves. And that island was somewhere where Paul wanted to see the church community established to be able to be formative to reach the world, because that was his whole desire. And even in prison, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, pray for me that I may have utterance to open my mouth to show the mystery of the gospel. And of course, by letter, he couldn't get out of prison, but he wrote letters because he had this great burning desire to see Christ being magnified throughout all the nations of the world. And so Crete had many harbours. There you see some of them. Some of them are mentioned in Acts 27. Uh, Salmone and then 
Alaisa and then Fair Havens, Phoenix, are places and harbours. So ships pulled in and there were strategic areas that Paul wanted to see churches planted that could even be used of God to reach the world. All right, today's theme, I'm using this from verse 5, it's order. We will understand that as we go on. Gospel-centred. What do we mean by gospel-centred? What is it to be gospel-centred? Let me ask you a question. Are you gospel-centred? Is your thinking gospel-centred? Is your career, is your destiny, is it gospel-centred? Is your home life gospel-centred? How do you behave? How do you see people you interact? Do you see them as your equal? Do you see them as loved of God? Do you see them as no different from you? And the only reason there is a difference is a thing called grace. And that makes us different. By grace, you are saved. So that's why we need to have a gospel-centred orientation in our desires, in our thinking, and in our attitudes, especially as we interact with the world. So here he says, and this is the verse five, and this is what I want you to come to, the gospel order. He said, I'm sending you to set in order. Now, I want to break this up because the Greek word for order is what we call, if you can see it there, epidiotho. Think about it. You know, a lot of our medical words come from which language? From Greek. Can anyone see what that word might mean? What do you know a word called ortho? Huh? You know what orthopedic is? These things here. They're called bones. And the epiortho means, as it will show us, they're setting broken limbs, straightening crooked ones. Isn't that wonderful? So if you're going to be, you and I are broken people. Sin has broken our hearts, desires, thoughts, minds, and we've got to be reset. And the crooked in us has got to be straightened. Otherwise, what happens if you break a bone? I broke a bone in this hand. And you know what? It never heals. I could still move my hand because in the wrist you've got two movements. But what happened was then I went to catch a ball and it hit me. And my whole arm swelled up. I had a broken bone and I couldn't move. And they put plaster and then the bone would not mend because it was broken away from the body. And virtually, I had to have an operation. They call it a bone marrow uh, setting, and I had to have it joined back together. So what happens if we're broken, we're of no use. And that's why we are some way impaled where we're less than what we should be. And also, what happens is in the book of Hebrews, this word is used in uh, that verse uh, there called Hebrews 9.10. And it uses the word and it puts here reformation. So do you understand what order is? It's setting the crooked straight. It's being a great reformation that's going to take place in the community around us. So how is it? It's a gospel-centred community and it's a gospel-centred reformation. 
It's a gospel-centered correcting of all the brokenness and straightening it all up and bringing it into functionality. So that's what we want to see. So what we find here, uh, the, it was our Lord Jesus, and you remember in uh, chapter uh, Luke 4, 18, and it's also from Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, listen to the Lord's word. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he hath anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and new sight to the blind, to set at liberty those having been crushed. Look at that. That's a work of order, reformation, resetting all the wrongs of this world and resetting them to be straight and right. And that's why you and I, it's only by the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, all his beauty, glory, wonder, splendor, majesty, when he took up my sin into his body and suffered in my place. And that, when I saw that, I then realized what a sinner I was and how his love touched my heart and changed my life. And you know what? God can do that for you. I can't change you. Nobody can change you. But the love of Christ can change you. And that's what Jesus said will happen. All the brokenness will be healed. All right, the structure of today's message is going to be this. The strategy for order, all right? How, what strategies are we going to use to put right all the wrongs of this world? Bringing order out of disorder, because that's what our world is. There's so much, but how are we going to reach them? How are we going to set their joints right? How are we going to do this? And so there it is. And it's finally the power to transform disorder. All right, we will uh, look at it. And uh, firstly, it's the presentation of God. Remember, I'm going to build on our, what we've already had. It was here that Winston told us about Jesus Christ, who he is. And here it is, he's a servant, and then he says, the acknowledging of truth, which is after godliness. You see what you understand, this island had become the birthplace and the burying place of the number one god of Greece, and that was Zeus. And they all adored and loved this god. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was a womanizer. He uh, had lived a very loose base and life. He seduced many people, uh, many women. And so that was Zeus. And they held it. And he was their God. And that's who they copied. You know that, don't you? Whatever you worship, you'll be like. You know? Whatever we worship, if, if I, I love a pop star, then I will dress like a pop star. If I love this, I'll, I'll dress like that. People, whatever you adore and love and worship, you seem to follow. And that's why the whole area of Crete was so broken. Now, and then we remember seeing a God that cannot lie. Zeus was a liar. And he never spoke the truth. And people thought, that's okay. You know, we're, this is our world. We follow Zeus. We worship. We love him. So telling lies is just a norm of the day. But here, Paul introduces a different God, a God that cannot lie. His whole nature is truth. 
And therefore, when that nature comes into you, you know what happens to you? You hate lies. You despise lies. So I'm not going to tell lies anymore. I'm not going to cover you. I'm not going to tell lies just so my parents won't find out. Finished. Because truth is the best way. You know what? You're always plagued. You can't sleep because in you, you've got a conscience and God replays that conscience. Always speak the truth. And if you tell lies, I tell lies sometimes, so we have to be so careful because what people call a white lie or a little lie or maybe a fib. And so we talk of like this, but it's all lies. So let's try and be truthful people. And if you fail, you ask the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry, I told that lie just because I wanted to get rid of that boy or get rid of that girl. And they are tormenting me. And, but I'm sorry, Lord. And so you can always do that. Remember, we have to present. If we're going to see a change in, in the disorder of this world, let's present a God who cannot lie. Then here we have, but has in these last times now, he has committed to us thus from the word through preaching which is committed to me according to the commandment of God our Saviour. Do you remember when we looked here, we had to see something very, very special. And that was God was our Saviour. You know, that's important to the Cretes. You know why? Because they believed that Zeus was a man but when he died, he became God. So that is, the man became God. And that's why, but here, God became what? A man. It's just counterculture. It's just the reverse. And that's why here, he calls God our Saviour. And you're going to find it because here, if you look through uh, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, that in everything we may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour. Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. And also we find here, um, and in everything, uh, the God, uh, the God our Saviour, there it is, uh, appeared. All right, so that's good. I missed one. Okay, that's all right. So, but that's why we understand Jesus Christ as the second person of a Godhead. And there, remember, it's important because if God is love, he must have had someone to love. Otherwise, love didn't exist until you, God created Adam and Eve. Now he's got something to love. No. Love is eternal. And therefore, there were the three persons in eternity and they loved. And they were all, lives were moved and generated by love, one for the other. So that's why we must see. Now, what we want to do is the vessel. And I think uh, last week, Brother Wing gave us those 15 characteristics traits that God's grace produces in the church. Remember, there's many traits and I, I brought them into five, all right? Biblical, uh, marriage, ideals, then responsible and accountable uh, to God and man, and then controlled temperament, you know, having being able to not lose it as we call that, and then wine and money are not absolutes. That is, I don't live for that. And then unselfishness and justice. So they're the real issues. And this is what God wants the church to be. That's what a church should be. That he puts those men there so they can example and they can give us the leadership and show how we should live before God. So a church like this is able to change the order. 
that's in our world. So let us then move on. Um, here, God's grace produces Christ-like character that will hold fast faithful words as he has been taught. I use the verse 9. I know Wing used it last week, but I use it again because what have you got to do? It's one thing to learn the Bible. It's one thing to know it's true. It's another thing to hold on to it. You know, um, I seen people when they go to the bank and they have a lot of money, they have a handcuff around them and around the bag. You know why? Because of the value. They don't want to lose it. And that's why it says, hold on. Well, what's the most valuable thing you can have in this world? It's Christ. It's him. And he's so valuable. Hold on to him. You know, there'll be lots of temptation. Ah, too hard. Or I can't. Or let it be. Or everyone's against me. Or everyone's rejecting. No, hold on. Hold on. Hold on to your Lord. And that's why it, it reminds us, that's what God's grace produces in us, a real character like of holding. And then to be sound doctrine, that is doctrine that is uh, pure and that is perfect and exhort and convince gainsayers. So if we don't hold on, we have no message for anyone. Now, Let's do an application and then we'll move on. So God's grace will enable us to hold fast words so you can bring healing to our broken world. There is the grace of our Lord Jesus. Tell me, do you know the grace of God? I know some here have brought great healing and been a means of healing. Remember, these are the means of grace. Use them. Personal life of devotion. How can I have sufficient grace? How can I use this grace to be able to reach these people in a broken world? There you are. Use the means of grace. Small group fellowship and prayer. Wonderful time. Because you can get together and you can ask questions and you can share with people. And you know, by the small group and sharing, you get welded together as a, a real unity because it's a reality. It's not theoretic, theoretic. Then also we see gathering for corporate worship as we are. And then lastly, serving others, both spiritual and physical. That is, they're all means. As I participate, they are means. All right, let's move on. And this is the major part of our message because remember that was our reading from verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. The circumcision party were Jewish people. Because this island was a centre of shipping lanes, import, export, was a really a big issue. And Jews gravitated to this island because of the prospering of business. And so many were there and many had professed and joined the church. But look at them. They're quite broken, aren't they? Their lives are quite broken. In some, they don't want to listen to anybody, let alone Christ. They said, I don't care about Christ and their empty talkers, whatever they've got to say, it's just more or less rubbish. And they are of the circus. They must be silenced and they are upsetting whole families and teaching for shameful gain. All they're after is your money. They want it. And they're really destroying families instead of building up. And one of their Christian, uh, a prophet of their own said, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. 
So there is um, the characteristics, the general characteristics. Of course, it doesn't mean everyone. I don't know, if you've ever been in a small island? When you're on an island, there's a characteristic about people. I remember I was in, the Philipp- uh, I was in Fiji, and Fiji had a university called University of the South Pacific. And different, uh, like Samoan, um, and uh, uh, Tongan, and also, um, uh, what's the other island north? I forgot now, I'll think it in a minute, and it'll come, Solomons, Solomon Island. They all came there, together with the Fiji, Fijian people, and they were in their separate groups. And they all had a characteristic. You know what the Samoans' characteristic was? Bad temper. They had chairs thrown outside their room and they had desks outside and they would throw things at each other. It was a characteristic. It's just what that island... And they, everybody excuses it. And, and that's what happens. You know, you get a culture developed and you say, oh, well, that's it. That's what they are. That's norm. And, and that's it. And so what happened, there was this culture that had grown up because um, I think we've been told about this verse uh, twice before now, so I'll leave it, but that Epi, um, Epi Men- Menendez, he was um, supposed to be the poet or what the poet was also called the prophet and he foretold future and foretold coming events or and whether it was true or not, it didn't matter. Anyway, he, he was dead by now. And of course, there were some who were worshippers of him, believing he had been deified and made God. So what we find is, instead of being shamed by the conduct, they're proud because I'm a follower and I follow this God. And look, and Paul had to write, he says, they glory in their shame, what they should be ashamed of, they are proud of. And so here he says, this testimony is true. That's what he found in the island. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. For there are many who are insubordinate, oh sorry, uh, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commandments of people who turn away from the truth to be, uh, uh, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. So he's showing, they believe that if I do eat certain food and I wash certain ways and I keep all the kosher rules, then all will be pure. But no, he's saying to us, we don't need rules and regulations to tell us what we are. If our hearts are pure and sincere, there was an old um, Puritan man called um, uh, Matthew Henry, and he said, our gospel perfection is sincerity. What is our gospel perfection? Sincerity. We're not perfect, we make mistakes. We tell lies. Sometimes we get spiteful and sometimes we get angry. But what is it? It's sincere. Let's ask the Lord for that sincerity. Now, what I want you to see is here, this uh, bringing order out of disorder. The first thing, what robs a community from being gospel-centred? It's good for us to think. What is going to rob us as a church? What is going to rob us as a community? Well, I want you to see, here they are, the circumcision party. Do you remember them? 
Do you remember the book of Galatians? Who gave all the trouble? Who gave all the trouble to Paul and those in that it was a circum... Meaning they're Jews. Circumcision. You have to be circum... All the males have to be circumcised if you're going to be saved. And if you want to get to heaven, if you want to be uh, with God, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. It's the same thing today. People put down all the rules and regulations. You know what we call this? There it is. There are two things, moralism or legalism. You know, people think, well, I'm moral. And, and look, don't get me wrong, moral, to be moral is very good. But it's not enough. It may bear you up, it may keep you from many sin, but remember, you need more. Because somewhere in life, your moralism will break down. Somewhere in life, you'll find, oh, out all came the temper, out came the anger, out came the lust. You find, oh, I didn't think I was like that. You know, that's why these are robbers of the gospel-centred. Remember, Christ makes us what we are, not finger pointers, law givers, and rule givers, and if you want to be here, you've got to do this, and we become all we want to see people in a uniform, all the same, peas in the pod. But here we are reminded. Now, here we find there is another one. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Do you remember the book of James? What was in the book of James? It seems to be these guys turn up everywhere in churches. And in the book of James, it says not everyone that what? Uh, that's, um, who can tell me? Come on, chapter one. It says, uh, not the hearers of the word only, but the doers. And you remember Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So there is those uh, professing to know, but deny him in their works. I put them here. We call that liberalism. Of course, the uh, bigger word is antinomianism, which means no law. Relativism, you know, it doesn't matter. Oh, you know, look at our society. It doesn't matter who you fall in love with, doesn't matter what sex, doesn't matter anything nowadays. And, and God loves everyone anyway, and so it doesn't really matter. So that's what we call liberalism. And they, they come into the church. And there they are. James was having to deal. And uh, in Galatia, Paul was having to deal. And they are the robbers. They are the ones who are thieves. And they rob us of the gospel. So remember the gospel of grace. And that's my next point, And it is this. It... Um, participate, not assimilate. If I just say, oh, look at those people over there. They're a bad, I'm going. I'm not going to, what's the good? How am I going to reach them? That's why we say participate, but don't assimilate. I mean, we have to reach people and the gospel of grace will give us the power and the gospel of grace will give us the love to now... And here we go, and it says there, why did Paul quote this man, Epimendes? Why did he qu quote him? Because he's trying to reach them through their culture. See, you know, Paul does that. Paul is using it, of course, here, and he's showing and he's showing to use the culture and show them the beauty of Christ. And that's why it is Paul's example to use the culture to speak into the culture. We can't run away from it. We must meet it. And, and don't be afraid. You are saved by grace and grace alone. Your identity is fixed with Jesus Christ who loves you with an everlasting love. And with that, you can go out. You remember, we, this is a big word also, they call it contextualise. In other words, we must be able to 
move and identify with those we are working, living and studying with. And here is uh, the, the portion where Paul, with all the gods, and there was just an inscription, unknown God. Paul says, hey, that's the God up there. See him over there? I will declare unto you. See how we contextualise? See how we use the very thing that was in the Athenian culture at the time and used it to reach them. And then, of course, as you know, he goes on and he says, and in this God we live and move, even as some of your own poets, your Grecian poets, whom you speak of, they have said, we are indeed his offspring. So like that, we don't run away. We go and try and reach. All right, let's move on. Participate, not assimilate. But God shows his love to us in why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then I want you to understand this. And then this beautiful text, for while we were enemies. You know what we were? We were sinners and we were enemies. So how did God treat you as a sinner and an enemy? How did he treat you? By reaching out in love and showing you his dying love and reaching to you, even though you were stubborn, you were proud, you were arrogant, you said, I don't want God in my life. And all, though you did all that, yet did God give up on you? No, he still loved you and he's still reaching you. So now, as God treated you, you go and treat others. You remember who you were and treat others that way. And so remember how God treated you. Though we were all condemned and guilty sinners, God's enemies, he loved you and drew you to himself and manifested his grace to you. So always speak into your culture with that attitude. A wonderful thing. You will be able to put in order all the brokenness of our culture and bring about a real healing in people's lives. All right. So grace trains us how to silence opposition by asking good questions, engage in culture and not start cultural wars. And there it is. I think I missed one. Oh, sorry. I get mixed up sometimes. Yeah, God has invested his grace in training us to heal. And there is the message uh, that he speaks. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce. So you see what grace does? It's a life's work. You're being trained. You know, you go to university, you get trained. You go to high school, you get trained. And, you, you know, you, you do certain things and when you get a job, you have to be trained. And grace is training us how to reach our broken world. All right. Here's our application. Here we are, bringing order out of disorder. And that's our application. Um, this verse has always been a treasure to me. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from whence you were hewn, 
and the quarry from which you were dug. Remember who you were. Remember what God did. And remember you were taken from a rock, you were dug out of the earth. Who are we? We're nobody. So therefore, humility and love for those who enter, humility and love for those we interact in life's journey and offer Christ. We can't offer him in any other way but in humility and love. That way, you'll be able to straighten out your twisted, broken uh, culture. All right, here's my last word here, the power to restore. And that is the power God promised beforehand through the, his prophet in the Holy Scripture concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, he is going to restore all things. He's going to bring a complete restoration, not only in you and me and other people, but in the whole of creation. He is going to do all because he rose from the dead. So remember, the power of resurrection life is the power that enters into us. There's a verse here in Romans 8, 11, and it reminds us that the, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you. And he who raised Jesus Christ, uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. So it is when in this life and in the next, he will restore you completely. It'll be an utter, complete and entire reformation and God will set in order this whole world of ours because it tells us that there in the book of Romans in chapter eight, that even this world that is in corruption and it is, uh, it's going to be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. So remember, there will be a real freedom and there will be a real restoration. And now you and I are to participate in that work of restoration of this world. And I'll just close here with this application in the, in the calling God has called you, seek to be an agent of transformation in word and deed. That's the most important thing. Set your life. We're out here to recover the losses. What was lost by in the Garden of Eden? Jesus Christ coming into the world, dying and rising again. Now it's a testimony that there's going to be recovery. And treat all as God in Christ treated you. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Lord Jesus, we thank you for yourself. We thank you for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, who is alive forevermore. And all that he does that he has promised and he has declared it will come to pass because he's a God who cannot lie. Strengthen our hearts to labour with him that we may also be able to set in order the things that are wanting in our creation, in our church, in lives, in my own life. Help me to set in order those things. We thank you, Lord, for this time together in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.